recording and say uh, hello to all of you. Good um, afternoon. My name is David Levy Faur, and I'm the host of the meeting today. This uh, meeting is uh, being handled uh, as part of a project called uh, Ma'avarim in Hebrew, uh, Transitions in English. And Ma'avarim transitions are about um, professionalization um, and support for young academics. Um, we do also like a content uh, policy, political issues, uh, wider issues, not only skills, but uh, the main idea is to work on skills. Today, we have the pleasure to host uh, again, uh, Professor Joel Migdal on the art of writing. Uh, Joel uh, is visiting professor at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Uh, he's also Professor Emeritus um, and the former Robert uh, F. Philip Professor at the University of uh, Washington, uh, the School of International Relations, the Henry M. Jackson School of International uh, Studies, re Studies, really. He was an uh, associate professor at Harvard University, at Tel Aviv University, and now he lives in uh, Israel. Uh, he's also the founding chair of the University of Washington International Studies Program. Uh, he's, he had the honor um, and he received the, the Distinguished uh, Teaching Award from his university in 1993. Also the State Governor, Governor's Writers Award, um, Distinguished uh, Graduate Mentor Award, and Distinguished Lecturer uh, in 2008, the Provost uh, Distinguished uh, Lecturer. So, uh, Joel, Joel, welcome, and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, thank you David. It's a pleasure to see all of you today, especially those who have your screen on. Um, I'm going to talk about writing, and it's going to be obviously across disciplines. There are differences from discipline to discipline. But I think a lot of what I say today will apply um, across all these different topics. So I'm going to give the theme of this talk as writing is the art of persuasion, in which you are trying to convince someone of something. And I'm gonna speak about what that means and how you can be persuasive in several parts of the talk. So let me start with the question of whom you are writing to. That is, whom are you trying to persuade? And there are at least two audiences that you must take account of. And often there's a third audience, which I'll mention as well. And as a result, because you're talking to different audiences with different levels of understanding and background, it's hard to find a single voice a single language that works for all of them. And we'll talk a little bit about how you might try and finesse that question. In other words, language that you use for one audience may very well turn off the other audience that you're trying to reach. So let's look at these th possible audiences. The first audience is very small. It's the limited number of people who think about research, and write on your very specific topic. Now, obviously, they're the most important to you. They're the ones who are dealing with theories and ideas and different kinds of experiments that you're dealing with, and you're trying to convince them that you have something important to say to them. We'll come back a bit to what that is. The second audience <clears throat> is a much broader one, it's, but it's still fairly limited. It's the people in your discipline or your subfield or related disciplines who have some familiarity with your topic. If you're an engineer, a civil engineer, they know about building bridges even though they deal with water, um, but uh, they are somewhat removed from your topic. They don't know the very detailed, specific elements that you're writing about. The third audience, which some of you may want to address, is a broader audience of academics outside your field, outside your, your discipline, or even the public at large, 
These are people who have very little familiarity with your topic, what's already been written on your topic, and so on. The first audience, that very narrow group that you're trying to address is very precise, topic-oriented language that you need to address with them. This is often called scientific jargon. Its precision is important if you are going to persuade them of the importance of your findings. They want to know exactly what you're saying. That kind of language, though, is very off-putting to the second audience. And it's very important that you address the second audience because in almost any job interview or tenure review or um, uh, branch proposal that you write, it's very unlikely that you're going to have just the very narrow people who know your topic well. You're going to have much more a much more general audience sitting there and reading your job application or your grant proposal, and you have to reach them. And the jargon, the precise scientific language that you need to use with your smaller audience is a turnoff to them. So uh, what do you do? Um, and even more so, if in your particular uh, field, you are addressing a public audience or a broader university audience, they are even less familiar with the language that um, your topic demands or even that your discipline demands. So, uh, and let me add one other thing here, uh, which I think especially true um, for people listening today, the language problem of using the right language is especially acute for people who are publishing in a language, say English, that is not their native language. And the reason for that is not that they don't know uh, English well. Many, I'm sure you do know English very well or whatever language you're publishing in. But non-native speakers often become very fluent in the second language through their academic studies, rather than on the street and rather than through elementary school. So everyday speech is a little more foreign to them than is the language of academics. I can speak for myself that my Hebrew is great when I'm listening to David Levy Fowler give a lecture, I can understand everything. But if I go into the bike shop to have my bicycle fixed and the two uh, mechanics there are talking to each other, I get very little of what they're saying. I don't know that street language, the army language, the kind of um, language that they use. So the result can be for academics that you internalize an overly formal, jargonistic form of speech that is often impenetrable to those you're trying to persuade. And that is something that needs to be taken account of. So what do you do to reach these multiple audiences? There's no magic bullet here. Um, I think you need to lean towards everyday speech, whether you're in the sciences, the humanities, the social sciences, or other fields, you've got to limit the jargon as much as possible. Now that is a bit dangerous. So how do you get the kind of precision that you need in your language and still use everyday kinds of words? First of all, you can relegate as much highly technical language to footnotes as you can. The footnotes in which you say something more general, you can put in the footnote if the kind of uh, article or dissertation allows it, to put in the footnote the precise um, language of the scientific field that you're dealing with or the humanistic field that you're dealing with. Thereby you keep a kind of clean, readily understandable narrative in the text itself, 
but you have a more precise alternative account to those who need it in the footnotes. You also can use technical terms and introduce them to your more general reader, but you just have to make sure that you define them well in clear, plain language. As much as you can use that clear, plain language, the more persuasive you're going to be. And third, and very important, if you are a non-native speaker of the language you're publishing in, say you're publishing in English, um, you must have a native speaking non-specialist review your writing, not an editor necessarily, but your partner, your mother, someone who is intelligent, but does not know your field and say, is this intelligible to you? Where does it get bogged down? Where am I obscure? Where can't I really reach my audience? And they can help you make it as accessible as possible. And that's really quite different from a kind of professional editor uh, because a professional editor will often stick with the uh, jargon and the scientific language you use, just make sure it's grammatically correct and um, the syntax works. Just on a personal note, I'll add that um, when I finished my dissertation, I published it as a book and um, I was very happy with it. Um, and uh, about a year after I published it as a book, I got a letter from the publisher. In the letter was a, uh, back then we didn't have email, so this was a real written letter. Um, and uh, there, it, there was a letter from, uh, that they had sent to me from a reader I had in India. I don't know who this person is or was, I never found out. Uh, but the person said, you know, I really like the book that this author wrote, but why does he have to write in such um, obscure and difficult language? Why can't he just keep it simple and straight? And I have to say, that was many, many years ago. It really made an impression on me until this day in which I changed my writing to be more accessible, to be something that people could understand, that my parents could understand, that my family could enjoy. And I find that very satisfying now. And I think it's given my work a kind of broader um, audience than I expected. I'm a political scientist. And at first people were reading my political science work, but then I began to see citations from sociologists, people in schools of education, anthropologists, historians, and even in scientific journals, um, using some of what I said. And I think it's partly because they had access to it in, which, in ways that they otherwise couldn't have had. So let me move to the second part of this talk which is how do you construct your article to make it persuasive or your dissertation or your book or whatever it is you're writing? Uh, because persuasion goes beyond the specific language that I was talking about. It also involves the structure or construction of the piece that you're writing. And that's very, very important. So let's start with that. Almost every academic piece of writing articles, books, dissertations, doesn't matter, should be built around two questions. Sometimes the questions are explicitly posed, sometimes they're implicit, but you need these two questions. The first question, what I call the primary question, the question is really structures what you're trying to do, presents the problem you're trying to address. Some call it the why question. Because if you start your question with the word what or how, you're often um, ending up in a kind of descriptive mode. Why is going to point you in an analytic mode. So this question is the hook, as they say. It's the hook to get the reader interested in what you have to say. It is a mystery. You are presenting a mystery, something that's counterintuitive, something that doesn't on the face of it, make sense. And that's what you're going to explain to your writer. 
after all, if the, your research and paper simply presents something that is intuitively understandable, it's not going to garner much interest at all. So here's an example. I've used this once before, and I like it. For millions of years, the Amazon River in South America ran from east to west. Now it does just the opposite. It runs from west to east. This is a mystery. What you're doing is creating a kind of paradox. How does a river change direction? Why did this river change direction? Here's the why question for you. And this is the hook that's going to get your, you, interest, uh, you interested. When my mother was alive, I would call her every day as good sons do. And, and I would say, uh, and she would say, well, what did you do today? And I'd say, well, I met with this dissertation student. And she said, what is this question? Now, my mother never even graduated high school, so this was, uh, but she was a smart woman. And I would tell the question of the student, and she would say, oh, that's interesting. Uh, I wonder why that is. Or she would say, that's not really interesting. And I would go back to my students. I would say, you know, you have to pass my mother's test, meaning you have to make it accessible and interesting and something that's going to hook this person who has no background in academia at all. So that's the first question. We'll come back how, uh, momentarily on how you construct that. The second question, which is I call the secondary question, really not as important in my mind, and it has elements that uh, are uh, key to understanding how to present your work. It addresses the so-called literature. The literature is the works that directly or indirectly deal with your topic, because you're not the first one to ask why the Amazon changed direction or whatever particular question you have. Others have asked it before, and if they haven't asked it, they've asked questions about other places or in theory, and they give answers to those questions. And so what you'd want to do in that second question is say, why did these people fail to answer my question adequately? Ah, you say, well, maybe they didn't fail. You know, they're smart people. These are big theorists. Well, if they didn't fail, there's no reason for you to write your paper or your dissertation. If they already have given the right answer, there's no reason for you to, 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 to do it. You are saying in some way they have failed to answer that question adequately. Example, again, the Amazon. The previous literature you're going to say suggested that the Amazon River's changing course was triggered by gradual changes in the flow of hot rocks deep beneath the South American continent. That was the standard answer that was given. You then have to show carefully how that answer did not work. It does not explain the, the change in the Amazon and why, it, why you're asking, why did it fail? You're really giving an analysis of its failure. That's your second question. So the question, second question is, why previous writers got it wrong? What did they miss? What did they misapprehend? OK, those are the two questions. Now, how do you build this? How do you construct all this in your dissertation or in your um, article or whatever you're writing? Um, so the, let's leave the introduction of whatever you're doing out of the out for a moment, I'll come back to it at the end. The first section after the introduction involves establishing the primary question. Now, um, that's that why question, the, the central question. It has to come very early in your writing so that, because you remember well, most academics, when they look at an article or a dissertation or a book or anything, they look at it and they sort of figure, try and figure after the first few pages, is this worth my time? 
Um, am I going to really be interested in this? So it's very important to establish the essential paradox very early in your writing, not to go off into tangents of methods and other things, which I'll come back to. Um, Im immediately, you want that question. And one way to do it, it's not doesn't work for all fields, but it works for many fields, is to start with an anecdote. Start with a little story which makes the dilemma, the mystery, the paradox immediately obvious, even before you start elaborating the scientific research that you have. Let's take a hypothetical question from the current situation uh, here in Israel. So the mystery might be, why did Israeli intelligence, which is heralded as among the best in the world, totally fail to anticipate the Hamas attack on October 7th? Okay, so it's a good question. Why? I mean, there's such a good intelligence. It seems like a paradox. They should have known. Okay. So one might start not with the overall answer that you have, which we'll come back to, but one might start with the anecdote of the female scouts in the army who were sitting on the border and they were reporting <clears throat> all the makings of an imminent attack to their superiors, but their commanders dismissed them. So you, the, what you're doing in that anecdote or that story is generating the, the kind of puzzle that the reader wants to feel. What? Yeah, why did they ignore them? They saw all the signs that things were going to happen and they ignored them. Your question is bigger than that, but the anecdote focuses it for the reader as something really worth uh, pursuing. Um, so the anecdote then is like the hook to engage the reader, to understand the paradox on a simple level through a simple story and get the reader to read on in your, in your um, account. Um, so the first section of the paper after the introduction is using your research and your evidence to establish that mystery, that paradox. It's the evidence that you need to show, first of all, that there in fact was a superiority of Israeli intelligence, that in fact it was uh, uh, known as one of the best in the world and so on and so forth. And then you've got to follow with the evidence of its uh, puzzling, massive failure. Or the evidence, you need to show the evidence of the Amazon, how it ran for millions of years, what its course was, and then show how it changed courses. So here is where your research is thoroughly pre presented, because herein lies the key to being persuasive. The research is what is persuasive. I'm not going to come back to how you can make it even more persuasive. So that's the first section of the paper. The section, second section of the paper, does, this is a little mechanistic, so you can move it around a little, but it works. Um, the, second is, the second section is your second question. Now, I personally don't like to call this a lit review. I find lit reviews boring, right? If you're just going to, this one said this, and this one said that, and you're, you're, you're citing everyone and his brother uh, who says anything on your topic. No reader really finds that very interesting. What I try to do is select the key people in the field, either th who have written specifically on my topic or have written more theoretically on the topic and say, what is their answer? And here, you, here I, I really don't like when the literature, often an author is dismissed in one sense. You're taking these people very seriously. You're giving them the benefit of the doubt. You're saying, look, here's what they said. And let me analyze it very carefully because I think there's a flaw in what they do. And I'm going to show you the flaw. Rather than giving a whole big lit review, you're focusing it on the important people in the field. For example, if you're 
taking the question of why Israeli intelligence failed, you could look at how people explain the intelligence failures at Pearl Harbor or Operation Barbarossa in World War II or the Yom Kippur War, as well as more theoretical international relations theories which deal with this without even dealing at specific cases. Focus in on those and show how they, what they try to do, how they try to answer the question, and how they fail. Okay. Um, now, you must show that these answers don't fully work. And that's really where you have to be as persuasive as possible. It really demands an in-depth reading of the existing literature to persuade your reader that what has been written in the field so far is inadequate or wrong or needs to be modified, and it doesn't do the job. So that's the second section of the paper. The third section, and often the longest section of the paper or dissertation, it's some chapter in the dissertation, is your answer to the primary question. It's drawing on your research, your evidence, you're explaining why the river changed direction or why the intelligence services failed. This is where your research and analysis comes in. You must repeatedly, this is very important, you must repeatedly refer back to your primary question. Because as you give the evidence, it's very easy for the reader to get lost in all the evidence that you have, whatever it is, archival evidence, experiments that you've run, uh, interviews that you've done, they're interesting in their own right. And then the reader says, well, what am I reading this for? Why, why am I here, right? Why am I in the middle of this dense uh, set of ev evidence? You must always relate the, question, the uh, evidence to the primary question. Don't be afraid of repeating yourselves. It keeps the reader on track. Um, the fourth section dives back into the literature. So it asks, how does your answer, how does your argument, your research, your analysis replace or modify existing theories or answers? How do you really change the field through your research? Now, let me go back to how to write the introduction um, because the introduction is obviously important. Uh, it's there that readers kind of decide whether it's worth their time to move on or not. And your job in the introduction is to convince them, yes, I have something very interesting to say, keep reading. The, re the re introduction should not be so long that the reader loses interest in before they get to the meat of your work. It needs to be concise. It usually has four parts. Number one, you've got to somehow foreshadow your primary question. You've got to get them to understand the paradox or the mystery that you are trying to solve. You then want to also give them a very brief hint of here's the argument that I'm going to make. Here's the answer I'm going to give to that question. So that's part one of the introduction. Part two, um, you need to give the question appropriate context. In other words, often the questions that you're dealing are quite specific. Um, and you have to somehow give a framework in which the reader, particularly those from your second and third audiences, understand what's going on. Um, you know, I, I, I remember this wasn't something I wrote, but something I was having a conversation with someone who's a very famous international relations scholar in the United States. And I started talking about uh, whatever the issue in the Middle East was at that particular moment. And he said, well, wait a second, I don't understand. What, what are there conflicts there that are, 
And I thought, this is an international relations specialist, but he really needed a context for understanding the specifics of what I was talking about, right? Um, so for, let's say, the intelligence failures that we talked about, it means giving some context of the longstanding Palestinian-Israeli um, conflict of Hamas and so forth. The third thing you're trying to do in the introduction is to persuade your reader that you can be believed. Now, this is very important. And it's you, you, if you look carefully at the best articles, you're going to see some of this. You have to, in a sense, tout yourself because there is this question, why should I believe you? Why, what, 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 what you know, who are you to, to answer this question? And the answer comes in several parts. First of all, it's your personal credentials, right? I've written on this topic before, or I have another article. I, and also what you did. I had 50 interviews with people who are important here. I went to such and such archives. I ran the following experiments. You want to say what you did that makes you believable and, an, and, and a, a, a trusted interlocutor in the field. And here is where also you introduce your methodology. Now the methodology, uh, I should add, varies tremendously by dissertation and by field and by article. Um, sometimes it takes what your contribution is is methodological. But at least in the introduction, you have to say, look, I use the following methodology, which is the way to get at this, right? It's the way to get at this problem. I went, I did this kind of content analysis, or I did these sorts of experiments, or whatever it is. So again, your, your persuasiveness hinges on your convincing the reader that you're the one they should listen to. And finally, the last part of the introduction is a roadmap. That is to, to indicate, often just in a paragraph at the end, here's what's going to follow, right, in this article or in this dissertation. Here are the, how the chapters are organized. Here's what I'm going to do. Now, you also are probably going to have to do a conclusion. And the conclusion will have several parts, three parts. One is a brief summary of your question, your primary question and answer. The second is the significance of your findings and analysis. How does it relate to the theories of the field? How do we, how do we begin to understand things that we didn't understand before? And the third and final is you want to present avenues for further inquiry. What kinds of questions were left unanswered? What will you do or others should do in the future to really understand the topic that you are um, analyzing? So I don't know, David, can we take some questions or I'm, I'm finished. Yes, uh, time for questions um, and comments. Uh, we welcome those, please. Uh, just raise your hand. or just come in uh, with your questions. I just want to say thank you very much for a very um, well presented. I'm not giving you any, uh, any. I'm not grading you. I'm just, uh, just want to thank you very much for this very uh, elaborate uh, conversation, which was held, you know, it was, it really felt like a, a conversation, even though you were the primary speaker. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, Anat. Uh, others, please. Uh, if it is possible to ask a question. Yeah, Tila, Thank please. you. Um, how much in an academic paper you can be um, with the name you give to the paper? Or you need to mm. be precise. So the title of the paper, how creative can, can you be in your title? Um, okay, I'm writing a book now. Can I give you the title of it? Um, 
The title is, I'm almost finished with the first draft. I'm really happy. Um, the title of it is, Who Then Will Speak for America? Which, and then the subtitle is, The Creation and Unraveling of the American Public. So in the first part of the title, I think I was pretty creative. I was using a quote from a very famous orator in American history and politician named Barbara Jordan, who then will speak for America. It's kind of, but you don't get what's happening from it. The subtitle is often where you don't want to be too creative. You want to be very descriptive of what's going on in this um, article or dissertation, because especially when people look it up online and they're, they're doing word searches and other things of this sort, you really want to make sure that you're piece gets picked up. And that's so the subtitle can be less creative and much more descriptive. Let me um, add one, uh, two sentences on, on that. Uh, it, it varies between uh, discipline, styles of person, countries, and so on. But I think in the world of papers uh, and the uh, impact factor of the paper uh, citations, um, I would prefer to be as communicative as possible and use uh, both the title and the subtitle to deliver my main message. Because I want the, the, the audience to, to read this paper and not, uh, not, not others, to get an idea of what's the paper about, uh, even from the title, not, on, on, not only from the abstract. On the other hand, you want to be part of a disciplinary group, tradition, and so on. And I mentioned that it uh, differs between uh, uh, disciplines and countries and the time, but also between a book, maybe between a book and, uh, and a paper. What do you say uh, on that, uh, uh, Joel? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with you. I, I like sometimes when there's a little <laughs> flair to the title, but I think you, it is important somewhere in that title and subtitle to make sure the reader, or not, not just the reader, but the person who's doing, you know, looking through catalogs digitally uh, picks up your paper. That's that's the important thing. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have one question. Yes, somebody, please. Uh, first of all, thank you. It was very well structured, I think. Um, my my only I only wonder in cases where you know it's a grant proposal or it's a research proposal where we don't have you know very tangible findings you can uh, write about uh, how would you adjust uh, the structure if any? Give me a little bit more on what you're doing. I mean, when you have an an an, an, an a hypothesis or. Uh, you have a general idea. You have your research question. I mean, you're, uh, you know uh, roughly what you want to, to write about. Um, maybe it's uh, based on the, any on some previous research, um, but you don't have any findings yet, and you want to get uh, others. Maybe you know in a grant application. I think it's uh, something of that kind when you want to draw the attention of people. But you still don't have, you know, very uh, well put findings. Yeah. So I think that you know, in those circumstances, where you really want to develop the um, the paper or whatever the grant proposal, you want to develop it in the question part. How interesting is this question? And really bring as much research as you can to the development of the question. You still have to speculate a little, even if you don't have the evidence yet, on what your answers are going to be, what direction you're gonna take, where do you think this is moving, um, and where you're, where you're going to pursue it, how you're going to pursue it. But the real body of what you're doing, the major body is in developing the question um, through your research. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, we have a, a question here from uh, Tzachias Ashkenazi. 
uh, in the text, and I will uh, repeat it for everyone. Uh, Tzach is um, working on detection methods, and at the moment is uh, is testing a, a lie detection method that not, was not tested before, uh, not tested, not validated um, before. How can we take this kind of uh, well, natural sciences, computer, Tzachi, I'm not sure where you are doing this lie detection and put it in the structure of uh, paradox, mystery, and so on. Wow, that's a good question. <laughs> what do you think, David? I'll put, throw it back to I mean, you. Well, the, where do la, uh, uh, lies come from? Or why didn't... Uh, say uh, this and this president uh, where his lies were not detected despite the existence of uh, uh, detections method or criminal or politician, deep fake and so on. So I would, I would give an example, uh, tell a story. Um, if, if it's common in the, in, in, the, in, in the discipline and it's acceptable, legitimate by the, the journals in the discipline and so on. Um, so may, may I add something in that? Yes, please. So uh, thank you. And um, I'm testing a method that uh, was so far tested uh, for lives um, about episodic memory, like uh, personal participation, in an event that maybe the suspect is now uh, concealing or denying. Uh, this is the scenario that it was tested so far. And my um, novelty is to test this method for semantic memory uh, lies. Like, um, for example, um, uh, I suspect that someone is uh, a, a member of a terror organization, and I can uh, and and the knowledge that they are hiding is a general semantic knowledge about the organization. So this is my addition. This is my uh, okay. Note. So you're, you're all right. You're you're. I mean, it seems to me the question. Um. So we have the two questions, right? And the first question might have a little less emphasis than uh, than what I described. And that is, you can give cases where lie detection systems were used and failed. Um, and you're you're really asking why did those why did those fail? And um, I, I think that might, might be the emphasis. Again, you want you. I think you still have to create the mystery, and the mystery will be in the failed um, efforts to detect the whatever the terrorist or whatever was a, the criminal that you were trying to uh, detect his the whether it was truthful or not, and and the, the consequences of not um, detecting them. For example, uh, let's say that the terrorist of September 11, uh, we could not uh, finding out according to their previous acts uh, because they didn't lie about that. But if we could find out whether they are belonging to a, a terror organization, they would say they are not. And we would find that they are deceiving us. This would have helped uh, that case. Okay, I, I mean, I think that's a that's a good way of putting it. Thank you very much, Sarah. Please. <clears throat> First of all, thank you very much. It was really interesting and thought provoking. I want to ask you, as a historian, uh, I I find it very difficult to find theories or to. Uh, <laughs> put theories into a historical case study. Let's say I found in the archive something, files that no one ever researched. And I want to write the case study according to these files. But what theory can I, everyone wants theories today. I, as an historian, likes to tell a story. 
Well, yeah, I think <laughs> so. The story is your is your question and your answer, your case. Yes, obviously, but I, I don't think you have to think too much about theory in, um, especially in history. I think what you're really aiming to do is to say, are there cognate cases? That is, are, are there things that are somewhat similar to what I am, my case, elsewhere in the world, maybe not in the archives in Israel, maybe it happened in Europe or Asia or something, and it's people write about it. And how did they address it? How did they answer mm -hmm. that question? And then you begin to say, well, you know, here's why I find that way of answering the question needs to be modified, needs to be added to, needs to be changed, needs to be thrown in the garbage, uh, whatever you whatever you find. But I think it's very important to not isolate your case just as you know, something that stands totally alone without putting it in the context of mm -hmm. others who have tried to pursue similar kinds of questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Brilliant. you, both and Victoria, please. Um, hi, thank you very much. My question is, how important is it that the primary question is a why question instead of, for example, a how question? Uh, I've, I've read into this before, and uh, definitely, uh, you know, I have a, had a colleague, uh, Elizabeth Perry, very famous scholar on China, who said, ah, the why question is overblown. You could really ask it in other ways. I don't think you should get fixated on why versus how, I, but I do think that you need a mystery, that you need a paradox, that you need something that's counterintuitive so that people will say, oh, you know, my mother, my mother will say, oh, really, that's interesting. It doesn't seem, I would have thought of it differently. And there you generate your paradox, your mystery, your, your question, your why people want to read on from that. I, I don't get too hung up on the why or how. Thank you. And we have two questions from in, in, via text from one. The first one is from Tammy. And Tammy asks, um, you say simple, right? Simply. But what about the discipline? The discipline might prefer a more complex, more, more uh, ritualistic uh, style of writing. How do you deal with this uh, uh, challenge? Yeah, this is a big question because, you know, especially in recent years, um, well, I, I can speak about the humanities and social sciences more than sciences. You know, the humanities have become, um, especially in post-structural humanities, extremely, extremely um, opaque in the language that they use. And, I am maybe I'm old fashioned, but I think that um, actually you will be appreciated more in job applications that you make, in grant proposals, and in articles you send into journals if you put that in language that has a broader appeal. And uh, I know it's going against the trend in some fields, but I think it's really important to do that, even in highly scientific articles. Yeah. Thank you. But take uh, into account the discipline and the commu scholarly communities that you are part of. Absolutely. Yeah. Noit Gronau and then Karen. Please, Noit. Hi. Thank you so much for the <clears throat> very nice and constructive uh, talk. I have two small questions. One, some people um, uh, during the introduction uh, foreshadow their results. So they'll say in this paper, I will to foreshadow, they even explicitly say to foreshadow my results, this is uh, uh, what's going to, do you often use this and in which part of the introduction? And let me just ask the second question. Um, I, there's a, in, in one of uh, the best uh, journals that I, that my, my field publishes in, 
they recently um, decided that they will only publish studies that explicitly um, talk about some uh, conflict between two theories and how your own research resolves this conflict or something like that. So, so they will they will not even accept. Uh, they will they will reject. Um, anything that does not necessarily relate to a specific uh, theory or even uh, uh, some tense between two theories. What is your, um, what are your thoughts about this? Yeah. Um, first of all, I'll just say in advance that you have to be sensitive to your de discipline, to the way things are done in the discipline, how specific journals handle this because it even within a discipline they may handle it differently as far as foreshadowing goes i think that's fine and i think it's good i would put it i would first generate the question give some context for it and then at that point in the introduction remember the introduction should be fairly concise foreshadow i think it's fine to foreshadow say but what i'm going to argue is you're not giving away the whole article here you're not doing presenting your research, you're not presenting your findings, but you're giving a sense of where you're going to go with this. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that helps. This is like, um, this is like part of the roadmap that you maybe mentioned before. I think even not before, the roadmap, uh -huh. before the roadmap, where you develop the question and, and, and here's what I'm, how, here's how I'm going to answer it. Here's how I'm going to do it. Um, as far as the theories, I, yeah, I, I think, look, that's the secondary question in my mind, right? What I call the secondary question. Some journals may put it number one, then you, you have to be sensitive to that. But it is exactly what you're saying. It is the literature, the people who are most important in this field don't agree on how to deal with this problem I have. And, I, and here's what they one says, and here's what the other says. And I really think that I can bridge them or I can modify them or offer something new where you're really relating to the literature, but giving your own contribution to it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. And uh, we have uh, two last uh, questions from one from Karen. And Karen asked, um, she said, thank you, first of all, very inspiring. And then she asked, can you take your ideas and does, do they apply to a review paper? Um, there is no own research or results to lead to. How can you do it or use it in a review paper? Yeah, I definitely think you can do it in a, re in a review paper. So let's say you're, you mean when you're reviewing several works, I'm assuming that you're talking about three or four books in the field that have come out in the last couple of years and you're dealing with them. I, I think the, again, you want to not just have this paper, this paper or this article and this book and that book and then one after another. It's like the historians say one damn thing after another and that's a very boring way to write. Really what you want to do is generate a question, but it's not, it's not based on the, um, the substance of what they're talking about, it's based on the books themselves. That is, one book says this and one book says that, or two of the books say, this, go do this approach and that approach. Why do we have contradictory approaches? In other words, you're generating a mystery or a why question or a paradox from the materials that you have. And your argument is the books themselves, right? You're taking them and showing how they do it, where they do it, and what you what you want to say about oh, the overall field based on, on these books. So I, th I think you can definitely use this approach, modified, of course, to, to that. Excellent. Thank you. And last question from uh, Yael. Yael, please. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. We Excellent. Do. So first of all, thank you very much. I, I know I, I probably speak for many people who are dealing with this and struggling with this right now. So it's very timely. And thank you very much. I wanted to ask about um, how you apply this kind of uh, the, the, the paradigm of the paradox of the mystery to a longer project, to a book length project. Um, do, do, do you suggest doing it once? Do you suggest doing it per chapter or a number of times throughout the text? That, that would be my question. Ah, very good question. And um, 
I have to say that I have dealt with this question a lot. I've had, when I was still teaching, I had uh, many, many um, PhD students, over 40. And so I, I had to hone my advice for this. And the advice is this, you're doing it on two levels simultaneously. It's a little complicated, but stick with me for just a moment. You're doing it for the book or dissertation as a whole. That is, you are a, I'm, I'm gonna say something that I didn't say before that I should have said. Um, the question, there should be a single question to your book. Single, maybe sometimes it, it has subparts and complexity, but something that when the person finishes your book, reading your book, <laughs> That, and the friend, their friend goes to them, oh, I see you read this book here. What's it about? They can say concisely, yeah, it's trying to deal with this question of the Amazon River, right? Or of it changing direction or whatever your particular field is. It should be something that is comprehensible. Similarly, and this is what I didn't say before, and it's important, when the person then says, yeah, so, oh, that's an interesting question that this book is asking, what's her answer? The person should then be able to say, the main argument of this book is X, okay? That is, you don't want, and I've seen books like this, and I, I can't remember two seconds after I read them what they said, they have 20 answers, right? They have they have a list of, of factors that affected it. Now, it's not to say that these factors don't, but they have to be built into a structure in which you have an answer that is something that you can apprehend and relate to your friend, okay? So that's number one. That's the first part, the book itself. Then on the introduction to each chapter, you have to say, Here's how this chapter, it, it doesn't have to be so explicit, but implicitly, here's how this chapter relates to my big question and my answer, okay? And second, here is the question in this chapter specifically, and here is the answer I hope to give. So you're having both a question answer for the project as a whole and for the individual parts. It doesn't always work, but it works a lot. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Joel. Uh, excellent, inspiring uh, talk, very clear and very useful. Let me just uh, say thank you for all the uh, audience. And of course, to remind you that we have a YouTube channel, website, uh, with more uh, presentation by uh, Joel and by others, actually. Um, hundreds of uh, videos on professional uh, skill development and, of course, research from Israel and all over the world. Thank you very much and see you soon. Um, have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.